How y'all doing? Good. Yeah, how about you? Yes, <laughs> it is. I, I went through a uh, metamorphosis. Uh, went through a change. No glasses. Hey, Trent. Tre um, I went through a change. I had to protect myself. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. It's, it's good to uh, be here. This is my second home. I'm so glad. I was excited when I got the, the uh, call from Doc. Um, Doc is my big brother. Age doesn't matter. Race definitely doesn't matter. Um, that's my big brother in Christ. We talk a lot and uh, me and him know that the world the world just truly hates to see us discuss in the way that we do. Um, they, the world tries its best to divide. It tries its best to make it seem like an older white gentleman and a younger black gentleman can't come together and speak and talk and we are doing everything we can to show that things like this, this church, is a living representation of what it looks like when you don't see black, white, red, blue, you just see the body of Christ. And so he called me, I said, brother, I will, I will not hesitate. I have something already that I planned on. Um, you know, things that I would constantly study over, and I felt that now was the uh, perfect time. But um, before all that, I do want to uh, just honor and give thanks to my father, who's also my pastor, for being here. Pastor Larry A. Smith Sr., I thank you for being here with me. I thank God for my lady being here with me as well. Uh, I thank God for uh, more than anybody. Can we just bless God even in this absence for Bishop Oskar? I, I appreciate the work he is doing, and we keep in contact on a weekly basis. So it's amazing to see what all he is doing. Uh, more than anything, I do appreciate the uh, the pastor doing the praise and worship for breaking the praise and worship to stop for a moment of prayer. Um, a lot of times the church gets too caught up in routine mm -hmm. and tradition, and it was amazing right. to see neither of those take place. It was amazing for him to stop, to say, we need just to stop and to intercede for a moment of prayer. Um, so that was amazing to see. It's good to see a church that is healthy, meaning you lead as the Spirit leads. You mm -hmm. don't go according to what's written down. You go according to what the Holy Spirit Amen. has to say. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. And it is it's it is timely. It's uh, For it to be a Thursday, it is good to be out on a weeknight. You know, in light of the virus yeah. that everyone is <laughs> you know, going crazy over. Out of all the sicknesses, all the diseases that have been here since the day before forever, this is the one. This, this is the one. I think maybe it's because it's named after a beer. I don't know. But this is the one. This is the, beer. This is the one that people are like, oh no, we got to shut the whole world off because of this. And I can understand, you know, as it ties into my message, I can understand places that out of precaution are doing things that are taking precaution, but I'm just excited to see you all here um, for the main place that if you were to do anything, you do it out of faith and not out of fear. Amen. 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 Doing things out of faith um, and not out of fear because we know that fear will lead us. Um, fear will cause us to start caving into the enemy's demands. Fear will cause us to cave into the enemy's desires, not just the virus, but whatever it is in your life. If you are doing it strictly out of fear, you are falling right into the enemy's trap. The enemy's um, desire is destruction, but his tactic, his strategy is deception. He will deceive you because his job is to destroy you. But he truthfully doesn't want to destroy you. He just wants to deceive you. Because if he can deceive you, he'll just watch you destroy yourself. <laughs> he'll watch you do his work for him. And so I wanted to bring a message today about a few things uh, in the Bible, a few different passages. You, if you were here last time, you know my saying. If you weren't here, this is your first time hearing it. I love to read, so y'all better love to listen. Okay. I read the Bible. There isn't anything that I will bring forth that cannot be reverenced at any point in time to the Word of God. Amen. 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 So starting off, we're going to start off in Genesis chapter 12. I have a few small passages that I would like to bring to you. But we're going to start in Genesis chapter 12, and I'm just going to read verses 1 through 3. Then we're going to jump over to Joshua chapter 6. But for now, just Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Amen. It starts off like this. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be 
bless. We are now going to go straight to Joshua chapter 6. And I'm going to read to you real quickly just the first five verses. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. It starts off like this. It says, Now Jericho was secretly shut up because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city. All you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days, and the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horns. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. And then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go right. up every man straight before him. Right. These two stories that I've just read, one from a man named Abram, one dealing with another man named Joshua. Both of these stories have one thing in common. They don't make any logical sense. <laughs> Neither of these stories logically make absolutely no sense. These stories, when you actually look at what it is they're doing, in the time frame they're doing it, excluding the fact that we have the benefit that they don't have, we have a Bible to read. We know how the story ends. We, we tend to forget that a lot when we're reading the Bible. How could they not figure this out? Well, because at the moment in time <laughs> that they were in, they couldn't fast forward and grab the Bible and say, oh, I know how this ends. Let me just go ahead and keep doing what God called me to do. Right. We have that benefit. They do not. So trying to get a better understanding from what it is that they're seeing, we can see that these stories just don't make sense. So today I just want to talk to you about a few things that just don't make sense. Things that just don't make sense. And it's not so much that they don't make sense. We as believers have to stop trying to make things make sense. We have to stop being led and driven by our senses. Our faith is not one of our five senses. So we have to learn how to stop trying to make sense. Let us pray real quick. Holy Spirit, help us to stop trying to make sense. Amen. Amen. Oh, you, I said quick prayer. You heard it. Yeah. We got to stop trying to make sense. So some of these stories I'll go more in depth. Other stories I'll glance over just due to time. Uh, but just starting off with Abram back in Genesis. Abram, who we know down the line is uh, known as Abraham. Abram is in the land. He's from a land that's called Ur of the Chaldees. He's from the land. He's been there his entire life. God gives him a simple order of instructions. He gives him one command. He says, get up. Leave from where you are at and go to a land that I will show you. The key word in the entire passage is the word will. That's the part that doesn't make sense, Pastor Craig. He says, go to a land that I will show you. It would make so much more sense if you took me to a land that you did show me. <laughs> it would make so much more sense. Like if you were to pack up and say, we're looking at houses in Troy. It makes so much more sense if you're leaving knowing where you're going. But not if you just say, honey, pack up the stuff. We're just going to drive on 994 and wait to hear back from Jesus. <laughs> when we run out of gas, we just got to get out and walk the rest of the way. That doesn't make any sense. But this is exactly what Abram went through. Abram was in a place in his life. He was very comfortable. He was doing everything right. He wasn't sinning. He wasn't doing anything God didn't instruct him to do. Just out of nowhere, God says, I have something better for you. But the only way you can get that is if you have to do something that makes absolutely no sense. I have to keep driving this point home because we see the world trying to make sense of a virus. We see the world trying to apply logic. We see the world trying to make sense of things using science, using data, using things right according to man, according to their eyesight. See, the biggest thing that we have to understand, Pastor, that I told you earlier, I didn't understand until reading the Bible. I thought the opposite of faith was fear. But scripturally, the opposite of faith is sight. Because the scripture tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. It tells us to walk by what we believe and not what we see. So we can't go by the things that we see. So this is what, was a what Abram was charged with. Then we get down to Joshua. Joshua is told to walk around a wall for seven days and to not say a single word until the seventh day. Now, again, logically, makes absolutely no sense. 
It makes so much more sense to just build a ladder, hop the wall, and destroy them from the inside. We know how the Trojan War was. We know that they built a huge horse to attack people from the inside. We know what makes more sense. And it's like when you look at the Bible logically, it's not supposed to make sense. The Bible will never make sense unless you attach your faith to it. The Bible, I'll say that one more time, the Bible will never make sense unless you can attach your faith to it. That is where so many now believers run into trouble because they live their life trying to make sense of everything. And when you start getting steered by what makes sense, it's only a matter of time before you start walking by sight and no longer by faith. When you start getting steered by the doctor's reports, when you start getting steered by things that man is telling you, you lose sight of what it is that God is trying to tell you. We, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. I'll take it a step further and say walk by faith, not by sense. Walk by faith, not by science. <laughs> None of those things can save you. Your sight can't save you. Your science can't save you. Your senses can't save you. Your faith is what saves you. Amen? It's, it's like... But a part of me starts to understand, you know, from a logical stance, because you, you know me to this point. I'm a very logical person. From a logical stance, I think sometimes we as believers stop realizing how ridiculous the Bible sounds to a non-believer. Like, have you ever sat and thought about how ridiculous a few of these things sound when you don't know how to apply the faith to it? My father, you, you all know now, my father is a pastor. We've had plenty of extensive talks. Most of them ended decent. Without any bloodshed, praise God. Um, but whenever it, came, <laughs> whenever it came to discussions about the Bible, the only pushback would be me trying to be logical about it. And the logic is what he's trying to get me out of, but it was the only thing I could step into. I looked at my father in high school, I said, so, <laughs> so you, okay, okay, so I'm gonna be real, okay? I'm gonna be real. So I'm like, so you want me to believe that a virgin somehow got pregnant. And this pregnant virgin gave birth to this half God. And not only did this pregnant virgin give birth to a half God, this half God ain't never seen his real baby daddy. Because his real baby daddy ain't even human. <laughs> Not only, oh, it gets better. It gets so much better. Not only did this pregnant virgin give birth to a half god who ain't never seen his baby dead, but he lived for 33 years. They killed him out of nowhere. He came back to life after three days. And then, in the middle of a conversation, stood on a cloud and just chunked the deuces to earth and just floated up into the clouds. You want me to believe that? He looked me dead in my eyes and said, Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you're supposed to believe. He said, you're applying so much logic to it that the only way it's coming to you is through a sense of you trying to be what we call a pragmatist, meaning you look at a situation and you try to draw a conclusion out of it just from what it is that you see. Just from what it is that you see. But we understand in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. How in the world can evidence not be seen? <laughs> That's faith. Faith is the evidence of what you cannot see. Faith shows what your facts can't. Faith will show whatever it is your facts cannot. That's like the story of people. There are plenty of people. We know of a woman personally that we, she told us she was going into surgery, long story short, for cancer. Um, she was at stage four. She goes in for uh, the treatment. The doctor comes out two hours later saying we couldn't find any of the cancer. We were just in there looking for cancer. That's faith. That's what faith looks like. The cancer was there when you pulled up to the hospital. The cancer was in all of the reviews, the x-rays, the CAT scans, all of that fun stuff. But when they go to do the surgery, they don't find it. You can't explain that without applying faith. See, because it's like... <laughs> Certain things you can safely assume because they make sense. If, if we're in a car, if I tell you, hey, pastor, just hop in the car with me. We're about to go somewhere. What's something you can safely assume? Anything at all? 
You can safely assume that I'm not going to kidnap you. I will not kidnap somebody twice my size. Praise God. You can safely assume that I'm not going to kidnap you. That's a safe assumption. You can safely assume that I know where I'm going. You can safely, yes. You, <laughs> there are, you can safely assume I know how to drive. There are a lot of things that you can safely assume. If you see a woman pregnant, what can you safely assume? I don't assume anything. <laughs> if you see a woman pregnant, what's something that you can safely assume? She didn't use protection. Oh, we're going to get rid of this little shot bubble that y'all in right now. We can safely assume that she had the sex. Okay? She had some type of the sex. I know that's a cuss word in the church. We can safely assume that she did what she did and the baby came out of her. You can safely assume that. Brandon, if I saw you wearing a Detroit Tigers jersey, I can safely assume you know something about the Tigers. But what happens if you get in the car with me, ask me where we're going, and I say, I don't know. <laughs> what happens when you go to a woman, congratulations, who's the father? God. <laughs> Let me tell you how sex works. I don't think you know. <laughs> I don't think you know. <laughs> what, what happens? Because this is exactly just the type, this is exactly what Abram and Joshua are dealing with. Abram is told to leave familiarity. He's told to leave everything and everyone to go to a place that God hadn't even presented to him. There's no map quests. There's no directions. There's no stopping at the side of the road. How do I get to Mount Sinai from here? God tells you to get up, walk, and go somewhere, and you have absolutely no idea where it is that you're going. Now see, the only reason I bring up things that don't make sense and how later in the story it actually applied, I actually want to draw your attention to where people got themselves in trouble trying to make sense. It's not enough just that the first two stories didn't make sense, but turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, I'm going to start at verse 8. There is a man by the name of Saul. Uh, the people were begging and demanding a king because they wanted to be like everybody else. God had better plans for them, but he said, you guys want a king so bad? Here's your king. He gives them the king. Saul is what they said. He was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. So he looked like a king. He dressed like a king. He resembled the king. His demeanor, his persona, everything about him resembled what it meant to be in charge, to be an order. But this particular story, we are going to see that he got himself into a world of trouble because he looked at a situation and he tried to make sense of it. So we're going to start at verse 8, but what I'd like to do just for the sake of time is give you a relap of, uh, uh, of uh, verses 1 through 7. So we are in a situation where there's a guy by the name of Samuel. He tells Saul to wait for him before he does something. Okay, this is just the cut and dry. He tells him to wait for me. Do not do what it is that you're about to do until I show up. He tells him when he's going to be there. He says, if I'm not there yet, don't do it. Wait on me because this is what God has ordered. This is what God has instructed. Wait for me to do whatever it is you are about to do. What happens is Samuel does not show up at the agreed upon time. Not only does he not show up, Pastor, he offered no apology. He offered no explanation as to why he was late. Which is how we understand that in context, we see that scholars said that God was testing Saul because at this point, God is like, I truthfully didn't want him. I anointed him because you guys wanted him. Let's see what his instinct is if he runs into trouble and doesn't do what man has told him to do. I told man, which means God told Samuel to tell Saul. So he's like, if you're disobeying Saul, that means you're disobeying me. So here he is. We pick it back up in verse 8. Verse 8, it says, according to, it says, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. The people started to leave, so he started to get afraid, started to wonder what it is that he should have done, if he should take matters into his own hands. And so that's exactly what he did. Can we go to verse 9? He decides he wants to take it. Um, he decides he wants to take matters into his own hands. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Verse 8, we see he did not show up when he said he would show up. 
Verse 9, we see Saul losing patience. All of his men are scattering from him, so he takes it into his own hands. Verse 10 says, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Samuel came the very second. <laughs> the very second Saul did something that he wasn't supposed to do before. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? What have you done? Saul replied by saying, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, i.e., you didn't show up when you said you were going to show up, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. So not only are my people fleeing, but now the enemy is getting closer to me. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. All he is trying to do at this point is justify why he did wrong. You know people in your life that don't just admit they did wrong, but they try to justify it. <laughs> they try to justify why they did what they weren't supposed to do. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. All we see from verses 8 through 13 is something simple. Saul tried to make sense of a situation. Saul said, just like the other two, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for you to not show up when you said you were going to show up. It doesn't make sense for me to sit and watch the people under me flee from me. It doesn't make sense for all of this work that I have been putting forth. It does not make sense for me to just watch it happen. Right? So he says, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to do what I feel is best. I'm going to sacrifice the exact same things that I would have sacrificed even if you were here. But since you're not here, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. It is so dangerous when we get to a place where we think we can tell God what we want to do. When we think we can say, God, I'm going to do this and I just hope you co-sign at the bottom. Of it. <laughs> I'm going to do this and then I'm going to come to you after. I'm not going to say, God, I would like to do this and then do it. I'm going to do something and then after say, hey, God, was that all right? Was, was it okay what I did? <laughs> well, was it cool that I did something without permission? Was it cool that I decided to take something into my own hands without actually seeking your face first? And that's where we get ourselves into trouble. We get ourselves in the trouble when we try making sense of our situations, when we try making sense of why we're going through things that we're going through. And, and it's like the point that I'm just trying to drive home is it's not supposed to make sense. If your story made sense, if your entire life made sense, God would not get any credit for it. God would not get any credit for anything in your life if everything in your life made sense. All you would do is tell him that you don't need him. All you're telling him is, I don't want you. I don't need you in my life. I got this without you. I'm doing perfectly fine without you. And if that were the case, we wouldn't need him. Right? But God, he, he specializes in things that don't make sense. I have two more scriptures for you. Luke, go, uh, go with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, these are the last two scriptures uh, that I want to drive a point home to. Luke chapter 1, verse 18. We are dealing with a man named Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth. Um, long story short, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they have been trying to conceive. Um, she was not sick. She was not ill. The Lord just, there. you know, there are plenty of stories in the Bible where God just closed the woman's womb. There was no sickness. There was no illness. There was nothing generational. There was no reason why she couldn't conceive other than the fact that God would close their womb for a set time. So they get to a place where they realize there's no reason for us to continue trying to conceive because we have not been able to. Then in Luke chapter 1, um, an angel appears before Zacharias with excitement. Appears upon, uh, appears upon him with excitement and tells him, you and your wife are going to expect a child. You and your wife are about to conceive a child. You should be happy. You should be excited. But I will tell you, you are to name the baby John. There's no lineage. There's no Zacharias Jr. There's, it doesn't matter who all you have in your family. This is what the child's name is going to be. This is where Zacharias got into trouble trying to make sense. And Zacharias said unto the angel, 
Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. Y'all see how, 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 how kindly he called his wife old? <laughs> you see how he says, I'm old, but my wife, she's just well stricken in years. You see how calmly he just dissed his wife? Like, look, we old, God. <laughs> we are old. There is, no, <laughs> there is no way we can conceive a child. But see, there he is trying to make sense of a situation. I don't know what the situation in your life is. All I'm doing is pointing out situations that we see constantly where people got themselves into trouble trying to make sense. And people save themselves a world of trouble by just doing what God told them to do, even though it didn't make sense. Even the things that didn't make sense. Why, God, why would I pray for these coworkers when you know don't nobody like me? <laughs> why, why would I apply for this job when you know I'm not qualified? Why, why do you want me to call my sibling when you know we hate each other? Why? Why do you want me to stop and pray for this person who I see on the side of the road every single time? It's not supposed to make sense. <laughs> His glory gets revealed in what doesn't make sense. But go to uh, verse 34. Same chapter, Luke chapter 1, verse 34. We are now dealing with the woman named Mary. You know, the, the woman that I told you I challenged my father about for probably six years. <laughs> uh, Mary situation is a little bit different because Gabriel, an angel, comes to her with the exact same excitement. Mm -hmm. Comes to her with the exact same eagerness, the exact same, just, she, he's so emphatic to tell her the good news, God has found favor with you, God has been pleased with you, you have never done anything wrong, nobody in your family has sinned against God, so he tells Mary the exact same thing that he tells Zechariah. He tells Mary, except, <laughs> he tells Mary, you are going to give birth to a child. This won't just be any child. This child will be the son of the true and living God. Amen. We get to verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? What I like most about the context of this is she said, I don't know a man, which is present tense. Which means she wasn't just bringing up she never knew a man and that now she wants to know a man. She's saying, I never did anything with anybody at any point in time and I don't plan on it. Not if this is how you want the glory to get revealed. So because she is so young, because she's a teenager, she feels that maybe this prophecy is for a later time. And you know, a lot of times we get to that place in life, myself included, where we'll hear from God and we think, God, this can't be right now. <laughs> maybe you mean this for a later time. Right. Maybe this isn't supposed to happen right here, right now. Maybe this is supposed to happen later when I'm older, when I graduated, when the kids are moved out. When God gives you a word, we will try to do everything we can to try to make sense of it. Yeah. We try our best to make sense of things, but things are not supposed to make sense. I, it sounds very redundant and I will keep saying it because it's not supposed to make sense. We have to get to a place in our lives where we understand God's glory can only get revealed in things that don't make sense because your faith itself is not supposed to make sense. Amen. Your faith has to be so strong. You have to be, I heard this from Pastor Craig, you have to risk looking foolish. Amen. You have to be willing to look stupid because of your faith. Yes, you have to be willing to look like people that do rain dances so that they don't have school the next day. <laughs> Times a hundred. <laughs> you have to be willing to say, I don't care how anybody looks at me. I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I don't care if the people are coming or going. I don't care if they like me. I don't care if they hate me. I don't care if they agree with me, if they disagree with me. When it comes to the God that I serve, this is the rock solid faith that I have. And nothing you do or say is going to stop me from believing in the God that I serve. You will never get me to a place in my life where anything that I see causes me to stop believing in God. You will never get me to that place. A part of me does believe that the reason this virus is going around, God's just up there like, now that I got y'all attention, now, now that, now that, now that y'all focused on something, now that I got your attention, because we see that a lot of things just, they're just not supposed to make sense. They walked to go back to Jericho in uh, Joshua chapter 6. They walked around the walls of Jericho for seven days without saying a word. You realize they were able to see them. I'm up on a wall. I see you walking. <laughs> and you're just not going to say anything. You and your marching band 
just gonna keep walking around, <laughs> not saying a single word. But see, a lot of times that might actually be best because one thing that um, Joshua and Zacharias had in common. Zacharias, we see um, back in Luke chapter one, verse fourteen, we saw that um, the angel had told him good news and he rejected it. So I know that we again, I know that because of time we can't really get into it. But what happened right after that? The angel then tells Zacharias. Everything that I said is going to happen, but because you doubt it, you're going to be mute. Mm. You are not going to speak. Yep. You won't utter a single word until that child is born. Yep. Some of us can't even go nine minutes without talking. Can you imagine how whole months mm. without saying a single word? Oh, some of y'all might actually be at peace if your <laughs> spouse don't talk for nine months, but I'm not going to get there. But they got to a place, Pastor, where he told him because you doubt it. You won't be able to speak. So we look back at Joshua chapter 6. That may have been why he said, I don't need you talking right now because I don't need you not believing me. I don't need you doubting and I don't need you messing this up. So from me to you, sometimes it's actually best for you to just hush. It's best for you to just be silent and hear from God. As my mom says, you need to hear God clearly and obey him quickly. Yes. We do not have time for delayed obedience, not anymore. Yes. We do yes. not have time to be obedient but delay and choose when it is the time that we want to do what he's told us to do. Come on. Amen. Amen. And so it's, it's, it's like there's so many, and whenever you get time, I want you to actually go back and read. There are so many stories that you can see they didn't make sense and people got themselves in trouble. There's a man by the name of Paul who was on a boat, and he was a prisoner. God told him what was about to happen. So he goes to the captain. He's like, hey, I don't think we should be going this way. There's a storm coming. We shouldn't go this way. But it makes sense to not listen to a prisoner. That just makes sense. It makes more sense to listen to the captain of the boat than the prisoner. But what happens is, and what I want to charge you is to be sure that you don't rule somebody out just because you don't view them as qualified. Don't be so quick to rule somebody out just because their faith isn't as strong as yours, just because they don't have as many degrees as you, just because they don't talk as clearly as you, just because their skin color is different than yours, just because their age is different than yours, just because they're from a different generation. Don't be so quick to write somebody off. Yes, come on. Just because you don't think you want to hear what it is that they have to say. That got them into a world of trouble. That got them onto an island that none of them should have ever been on in the first place because they tried to make sense of a situation. It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for Abram to leave the land that God already had for him for a land that he didn't even show him. It didn't make sense to believe that Elizabeth was going to be pregnant. It didn't make sense to believe that a virgin could have gotten pregnant. It, some things just won't make sense because they're not supposed to make sense. But because we just talked about the boat, I, I, I want to close with the... Uh, with the story, there was a man that uh, he found God um, when he was on a mission trip out in Australia. And he said uh, the closest he had ever gotten to God was when him and a couple other people were on a boat and they were heading off the coast. They were headed to an island. And uh, the wind started to take the boat. And what happened was it wasn't necessarily a storm, but the tides just got too much to handle that the boat started to deter, and they ended up smacking onto an island. An island, there was nobody there, there was no sign of life on the island. So what they did was they brought um, a lot of things together to make ember, to make a fire, right? So they make a fire saying, we're just gonna stay here. They went around searching the island, they came back to realize that the fire had gotten too big, it was too much for them to try to put out, they didn't have any jugs to go out to the sea and toss water on it. So the fire just gets too big. They run back to, they said, probably like a half mile or so away from the fire itself. They started praying. They kept praying. Night falls. The fire dies out. They wake up the next morning wondering how they're going to get help. You know, phone's dead. Um, not wondering if anybody even knows they're there. They said probably a couple hours into the day, um, a rescue boat shows up. A rescue boat came flying over. Um, shouting out names, saying, is anybody here? Trying to speak different languages. You know, they did the signal saying they were over there. And when they got there, they were like, thank you so much. We bless God for you. But how did you know we were here? 
how did you know that we were here? They said, well, we saw your smoke signal. We thought that when we saw the fire, that you were calling for help. So we saw a smoke signal, and we came over to help you. What they were trying to do, <laughs> what I'm just trying to encourage you through that story is because it took an entire day for them to do that. That story itself doesn't make sense because they got inadvertent help. <laughs> that help was not on purpose, right? Because that help doesn't make sense. God sees you. God sees your problem. And your faith is the solution to your problem. God sees you where you're at. He sees your problem. And your faith will be the solution. Your faith allows you to see the solution and not the problem. Your fear is going to say, what if this happens? What if that happens? Your faith has to say, even if this happens. Amen. Even if that happens. I feel that strongly for somebody. Your faith has to say, even if. There were three uh, young Hebrew boys that were with a man named Dan. When they get, we, we, a lot of us know the story of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar saying, worship the statue or you get tossed in the furnace. But what gets overlooked is the fact that before they went in, it was kind of an any last words type of speech. And in that moment, he says, we just want you to know that God is able to rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we are not bound to that statue. See, for the longest, Pastor, I was taught that they were confident that they were coming out. They were not confident that they were coming out of that alive. They were not confident... <laughs> That God was going to be with them. In fact, it even says that when they were in the furnace, they couldn't see Jesus. They didn't see the fourth person. Nebuchadnezzar and all of his men saw four people in there. But when they were in it, they didn't see him. When you don't see God in your situation, that doesn't mean he's not in your situation. Amen. A lot of times, others will see God working in your situation before you can see God working in your situation. Yes. So my encouragement for you is just to understand that if something makes sense, I really need you to take a step back and try to say, where is God in this situation? Yes. Amen. Where is God in this? Where, where is God's glory getting revealed? Who is God's glory getting revealed to? And what is his glory getting revealed from? Yes. Things are not supposed to make sense. And again, I can talk for hours and I do mean hours on things that don't make sense. I can tell you about Moses getting water from a rock. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you about things that just don't make sense, but you have to understand things are not supposed to make sense because that's how God's glory truly gets revealed. I don't know what the situation is in your life that just isn't seeming to make sense. I don't know, but I know everyone in here, including myself, has come in here today with the situation, with the relative, with the problem with work, school, with one of the kids. There is some situation in your life and you have been running in circles trying to make sense of it. Yeah. And I'm here to encourage you that God is saying, stop trying to make sense of this. <laughs> stop trying to be logical about this. <laughs> stop trying to make this all come together. It can't all come together without me. It can't all work without me. It can't at all come to pass without me. So whatever it is in your life, again, just understand that when it doesn't make sense, there's a good chance that you're on the right path because God's glory gets revealed so that he can show you what it is in your life that he's been trying to get your attention on. Amen? Amen. Amen. I just want to pray real quick for everyone here. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this day, God. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for this family. God, I thank you for... Uh, this ministry that you have called me to. I thank you for everyone and everyone's calling in this life that you have respectfully called them to. God, there are people in here right now that feel that they are in a situation that they just don't have control over. And so God, right now in this midst, I ask that you would send just a calmness. Send a calmness over every single family here, over every family attached to and connected to the people here. Let the people that are here be the faith that gets stretched out and extended to those who may not be believers. God, let it be because of the faith, the willingness, and the obedience of those that say, God, this doesn't make sense and I'm okay with that. I don't understand why I'm in this situation. I don't understand why things keep going this way, but God, I trust you in the midst of it. 
God, I trust what it is that you have for me. I trust your timing. I trust your judgment. I trust your plan, God. I've been trying to live by my will for too long, and I surrender it to you now. God, anyone here that has been continuing to try to live off of their senses, I ask that you would release them from their senses now. I ask that you would release them from their fear now. I ask that you would release them from common sense. Release them from the things that they have been trying to lean towards. Your word says to trust in you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. God, we are to acknowledge you in all our ways so that you can direct our paths. God, we can't direct our paths when we try to make sense of it. We can't do what we have been called to do when we try to look at things from a sense to where it, we can understand it. God, we are no longer leaning on our understanding. We are leaning to you for you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we will use this faith to allow you to come in and do with us in our lives what you have to do so that you can get the glory out of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give God some praise?